One of my professors uh, was doing a conference in, uh, in a relatively small town, and he needed to clear his head, so he decided to drive outside the town. And uh, he came across a country church that had a country cemetery, a rather large one, and he liked going through cemeteries. Now, I know that sounds a bit morbid to go to cemeteries, like kind of an odd place to enjoy going to, but if you've been a pastor most of your life, you've been to a lot of cemeteries, and yeah, they're kind of fascinating, not creepy after a time. And so he was there, and uh, he noticed, and he was looking at the dates of all the different gravestones, and he came across a section of the cemetery where there was a long row of beautifully lined up gravestones. And this cemetery, this cemetery happened to have a slab uh, going the length of each of the graves, so there's this beautiful line of slabs and, and stones. But he sees one off in the distance, and it's catty-cornered. It's turned at a at an angle, it's crosswise. He thinks how strange he goes up and looks at it, and he's looking at it, and happens to be another guy in the, cem in the cemetery, and the guy comes up to him and says, you're looking at that grave and wondering why it's crossways, aren't you? He said, yeah, it crossed my mind. He said, well, I happen to know that guy. I knew that guy all my life. And all his life, he was always crosswise with people. He always making judgments about people. He'd say, I don't know why they ask him to do that. He's not capable of doing that. Or why did the church make a decision to do this? Always thinking he was right and other people were wrong and making judgments about it. And the professor said, well, I, I understand that, but why would you put his grave crosswise? Well, that's the way the family wanted it. Uh, the family wanted it? That seems kind of strange. He says, yeah, he was crosswise all his life. They thought, well, if he's going to be crosswise in life, he might as well leave this world crosswise. And the professor said, well, that's kind of a, it seems a little bit mean. He says, no, family figured that God wants to change him. When he goes to God, God can change him. But the way he died is also reflected in the way he lived. Well, I thought about that story when I thought about the scripture from the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. It's quite an amazing uh, chapter. In fact, I got so caught up in those words about Paul, I kept thinking, where am I going to preach? It was a bit overwhelming. It was like me being a kid in a candy store. What am I going to pick? I can find at least 10 sermons in that, those scriptures. But don't worry, I'm only going to preach one. And I'll try to get to the point. When I looked at this story, I thought mostly about the part that talks about judging and being judged. How we tend to judge others and judge, and judge people. And I thought about what Paul had to say here in the scripture. I like the way that he said it. I want you to hear these words as they are paraphrased in the Message Bible. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. Let's hear that again. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. Insofar as it's up to you, get along with everybody. Don't, don't insist on getting evening. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, God says. I'll take care of it. I like that, and I think Paul understood something about the need not to judge each other because, well, he served a lot of churches that were always uh, filled with people who were nitpicky and judging all kinds of things. Remember, there were churches with lots of people coming from lots of backgrounds, so I'm not surprised by that. And I think Paul was also saying these words not only to us but to himself because I think Paul struggled with not judging other people and putting them in his place. You can read Galatians and you see what I mean. But that's just the danger that we find ourselves in. That we will have strong opinions, and in having strong opinions, we will think we're right and somebody else must be wrong, and we'll find ourselves looking down at them. We find ourselves in these days where a lot of us feel like we're more divided as a nation than we've ever been before. I'm not so sure that's the case. I can think back in the early 60s, the late 60s, we were very divided as a nation then. Back in the 1920s and 30s, there were there was great division in this country. Some people thought we might become more communistic or we might become a more, um, a more like a Hitler, more uh, a fascist in our viewpoints. 
Go all the way back to the Civil War, we were very divided as a nation, literally divided as a nation. And yet, it's true. We do seem to be more divided these days. We do be, seem to be divided into our different clans and our different tribes. We find ourselves not even able to hear each other, much less find common ground with one another. We have a way of having our individually ordained uh, news medias uh, ordained by the tribe that we're supposed to go to. And we go and we listen to those different news medias, and oftentimes we're not listening for what news there is to be found. We're listening for how it can reconfirm what we already believe and how we're right and the other group is wrong. And there's a real danger in doing that, that we forget about the humanity of the other people. I think Paul would have something to say about that. In the first verses of the scripture that we read today, Paul wants to tell us something different. I want to read that to you. Paul says, Do not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind. I like the way the Message Bible paraphrases it. Don't be so well adjusted that you fit into the culture without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. And this verse is really important for us to hear. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. I like that word immaturity because that's what it is. God brings the best out of you, developing well-formed maturity inside of you. Now that's true, isn't it? The immaturity of quickly making judgments and assuming everyone else is wrong, that we're somehow better for that. We're very prone to that. But rather than doing that, we're being invited to tune in to God. So rather than listening to the bad news of the world, we're being invited to listen to the good news of our faith and letting that shape who we are. Now, when I was a kid, uh, a youth, I don't remember uh, uh, feeling that I was being shaped by church. My parents, for instance, we were very young, insisted that we go to worship. We never questioned that we would be in church. It wasn't going to be something I could say no to because I just assumed, well, it's just what you did. It's what you had to do. But I was so bored. The, bored. the most bored time of my week was that one hour in that worship service, listening or trying to listen to that preacher say what he's got to say to us. The only relief I had in my little small church was that we got to open up the Coke machine at Fellowship and pick out what drink we wanted. And when I got to be a youth, we no longer had to sit with our parents. We would go up into the balcony that lined the whole distance of the church, and we would sit up there, and we would try to entertain each other as quietly as we could so we didn't get into trouble. And I remember one way we entertained ourselves one Sunday was that my friend Scott Bowie, his dad was a preacher preaching down there, and he was up in the balcony. Scott and I made a paper planes out of the bulletins. And Scott placed one of those paper planes right on the ledge. We were in the first row. And we sat there admiring how perfectly he had made it. It was summertime, and the air conditioning of the balcony turned on. And a strong breeze blew that plane on its maiden flight over the congregation of adults below. It didn't fly for long. It took a dive bomb into a woman who was in her pew. This was the 1970s. She had hair up like this. It landed perfectly in her hair, sticking up into the sky. And all of a sudden, the room was quiet. John Bowie, Scott's dad, quit preaching. He looked up in the balcony and he said, Scott? We're going to have a lot to talk about when we get home this afternoon. It is the first time I understood every word that he had ever said. Now, I remember that well because, well, worship wasn't something that seemed like it was shaping me at all. But as I look back at it, 
Worship, even at that time, was shaping me. The prayers that we did, the liturgy that we did, the communion that we took, even the correction from Scott's dad was shaping me into the kind of person I would be. And as I grew older, I got where I love coming to worship. I even enjoyed listening to the preacher, even found myself listening and letting the words affect how I saw the world and how I view things. The one thing that shapes us more in Christians than anything else is our being in worship on a consistent basis. If you don't want to change, if you want to stay like you are, you better not come to worship very often. Because whether you know it or not, that experience of joining together, the movement that is the same every week of worship, is going to shape your life in some way that will make a difference later on. And that's something that we're all called to do is to allow ourselves to be formed into the image of Christ. That is what Paul talked about, not letting the culture shape us, but letting God to shape us into who it is that we're going to be. But you know something about uh, being shaped? Sooner or later, if you're shaped in the nature of Christ, you're going to start to feel strongly about some things. You're going to have some attitudes that you are deeply invested in. You're going to have perspective on the world that you're convinced is correct because it's just the way things are. I was walking uh, recently, uh, hiking up in the mountains, and I saw in these beautiful mountains near a stream, someone had taken uh, a fast food bag and tossed it. It made me so mad to see it. This past month, I heard that they're opening up the National Wildlife Refuge and the Arctic one for oil drilling. And it shakes my bones. That's a refuge, I think. How? Do we dare mess with that when we ought to be focusing other forms of energy? Why do I believe that? Because the message I've been shaped in is that God gave us this creation. It's up to us to take care of it. And it's an insult to God to destroy what has its own value apart for its usefulness to us. I know the image, the issue of immigration is, a, is an issue of lots of different perspectives, a lot of different ways of saying it's a complex issue, not something that can easily be darned, ironed down to a few opinions. But for me, the very idea that we can put children and separate them, even babies, apart from their mothers without knowing where they're going or where they are is unspeakable. And when I hear that that was done as a matter of policy, to discourage immigration, it's, it's abhorrent to me. To every fiber, I don't want a penny of my tax money going to that. Because I think it's a front to Christ. I think it's a slap in his face to do that to a child. I have strong opinions about it. It's hard for me to hear people who may think differently about that. And yet, we're called to be shaped into the form of Christ, into the form of faith, that we find in our Bible, of turning the other cheek, of learning to respect and at least listen to one another. I know, um, I know um, uh, a professor of mine was also at a conference. He was preaching two different nights, and he, he was in the middle of the service, and a woman came in really late. She came in with all her children. They are making all kinds of noise. They were yelling and screaming and laughing. All, you could tell it really disrupted the feeling of the service. It was really a sacred moment for people. And he, he's not usually upset, but it did uh, uh, get to him a bit. Afterwards, they were in fellowship, and that woman came up to her, and she said, I'm the, I'm the woman with the noisy kids. And he said, oh, yeah, you're the woman with the noisy kids. And he was polite to her, had a conversation with her, and she left. She came back the next day, and after the service, came into fellowship once again, and came up to him, you remember who I am? So oh, yeah, you're the woman with the noisy kids. So I didn't bring them today. So I didn't bring them because, well, I bring them along when I don't want to be affected by something. But I didn't do it today. I came to hear the service. And he's thinking to himself, is she open to the good news? No. Yes. Maybe no. And then she shares something with him. She says, you know something? I've really messed my life up. I've made so many bad choices, I can't count them all. Is she open for the good news? Yes. And he realized how he initially judged her. There was more there. And that is the gospel. 
realizing that even the people we are so against, we, we feel are so opposed to what we are about, that we don't judge them. That leave that for God. Leave it up to God. God will take care of that because only God really understands. May we as a people learn to have the generosity and the love of Christ in our hearts that's open to the way God has formed us to be the image of Christ. Amen.